Hello and welcome. This is James from the DSO Imager channel. Uh, tonight I thought I'd tackle a uh, sometimes controversial topic. What I'm going to talk about is what you're seeing on the screen there, one-shot color cameras versus monochrome cameras. Uh, I'm going to go over the, um, the uh, strengths and weaknesses of both and uh, cover a couple of different scenarios with them. But uh, first, I do want to go over a misconception that I'm seeing out there on social media a lot. It, it seems to be coming up more and more these days. And honestly, I, I saw this again just the other day, and uh, it's what motivated me into uh, creating this video. Now, I'm paraphrasing a comment that I saw recently, uh, but something along the lines of, I don't have enough time to capture data with mono. Mono takes too long. You have to get three or four times as much data as you do with one shot color camera. And of course this isn't true. It's it's definitely a misconception. I'm not entirely sure where it comes from but I see it repeated frequently on social media, on forums, and it's uh, it's just interesting that uh, uh, that this is still out there. So uh, let me explain this. So one shot color cameras, they have this Bayer matrix. And that with that Bayer matrix, is, it's basically a filter that's printed onto the sensor itself. And it's pretty much covering a quarter of the pixels with, with a red filter, a quarter of the pil uh, pixels with a blue filter, and um, half the filters, half the remaining pixels with a green filter. And this is what allows a color camera to put together a color image. I mean the sensor below is identical to a mono sensor, just the monochrome sensor doesn't have this filter sprayed on. In fact it was a mod that some people would do in the past with their DSLRs if they wanted monochrome they would take apart their cameras and, and literally scrape the uh, Bayer matrix off. <laughs> It's not something I'd recommend anyone trying. I saw an article about that uh, when I first got into astrophotography and very quickly decided that if I wanted to go mono, I was going to buy a mono camera. So with monochrome cameras, the entire sensor is collecting whatever data the filter is passing. So I'm using red in this example. right? With a red filter, the mono camera is collecting four times as much red light as one shot collar camera does in the same amount of time. And that's just simply because only a quarter of the pixels are on the one shot collar camera are capturing red light. So in this example here, one hour of of one hour of one shot color data with red, you're getting fifteen minutes worth on that mono. So as an example with a mono monochrome camera, you can get thirty minutes with the luminance filter and then 10 minutes each of RGB and you basically have the rough equivalent of one hour's worth of data from a one-shot color camera. Now it's not exact, right? I mean you're going to lose some time if, if we restrict ourselves to 60 minutes. Uh, you lose a little bit of time on filter change uh, and possibly uh, uh, refocusing if, um, if you're not using filter offsets with monochrome. However, uh, the Bayer matrix is not perfectly efficient and so you're losing some data there with that Bayer matrix in place. So in the end it's pretty much a wash between the two cameras. So I mean in the end one hour's worth of one shot color data and one hour's worth of mono data split across three or four filters you're getting about the same amount of time. So uh, there's no issue here if uh, if you are not able to image for an extended period of time uh, to choose one shot color over mono because there's there's no uh, there's no integration time requirement. So again, this misconception is out there, uh, but it is incorrect. It's a misunderstanding. All right, so let's get to uh, the comparisons here. So we're going to go over the pros and cons and we'll talk about the pros first. So obviously with one shot color cameras they are less expensive. The the cameras themselves are typically a little bit cheaper than the monochrome cameras. 
Uh, I suspect this is mostly a, a scale of economy kind of thing. Uh, you know, more more color cameras are being sold across all industries in monochrome. Uh, and of course, it's easier to get the data in the sense that uh, there's only you're not having to worry about changing filters. You don't have to make sure you're getting enough time per filter, right? If uh, if you start your imaging session and then clouds roll in after two and a half hours, and you've got your red data and your green data, but you didn't get your blue data, then then you're not done. <laughs> you have to go back out another day and get that blue data. But with a one-shot color camera, it's not a big deal if you don't want to stay out or do another se uh, session. You can just run with what you got. And of course, less filters means less parts if you want to quick grab and go. And you don't have to get calibration frames for all the filters. And I'm talking specifically about flat frames. With monochrome, they are a little bit uh, more sensitive because that Bayer matrix is is not present uh, and often especially if you're doing um, a long exposure or a long integration time uh, 20 hours 30 hours whatever you can see that the the mono typically tends to be a little bit cleaner than the one shot color uh, also the color is more balanced I think with mono because again with one shot color you're doing 25 percent red 25 percent blue and 50 percent green whereas with monochrome you can spend even amount of time in each color uh, so you're not going to have a, a heavy green bias uh, like you do with uh, one shot color data and mono is definitely more flexible and what I mean by that is by having the extra filters there you control uh, what data you you can collect when Right, so if you have a, a bright moon up, uh, you can say, all right, well, the moon's out. I'm just going to get HA tonight. I'm not going to worry about O3. I'm not going to worry about broadband. And it's not a problem. Whereas with one shot color camera, you're really limited. I mean, you can get one of these dual narrow band filters, but uh, there, there's still some limitations there. And I'll, I'll go into that in the uh, next slides. All right, so let's go into some of the cons, right? So with one-shot color cameras, you're definitely limited when it comes to narrow band. Now, it's gotten better under certain circumstances, but in the example that I'm giving here is that uh, HA RGB images are, are really nice options to have when shooting astrophotography. Of course, you got your galaxy shots uh, with the HA regions, and there's a lot of um, uh, other shots out there where you have um, this uh, faint HA signal. It's part of the uh, uh, it's part of the interstellar medium that's out there that's not picked up at all, hardly at all, with one-shot color cameras. And you don't see it, of course, with broadband filters. Uh, but if you spend the time and get HA data, you can pull out all these interesting HA structures in the background in targets where people never thought there would be stuff uh, there would be HA in there uh, and I'll, I'll have some examples later in this uh, in this uh, presentation now you can use an HA filter with one shot color camera or you can use a dual narrow band filter with one shot color uh, with one shot color camera but if your main target is that HA data then that HA data is only going to impact a quarter of the pixels. There's a little bit of spillage on the green pixels, but I mean, it's not much signal there. So you're only utilizing about a quarter of your sensor when trying to capture straight HA data. And so that is definitely going to hold you back if you're going for an HA RGB image. Now let's talk about dual narrowband filters for a moment. Uh, they came out not too long ago, and they really have been a great addition uh, for one-shot color cameras. Because now, as I mentioned when that moon's out there, now you have a narrowband filter that you can get data with. And more importantly, if you're in a uh, high, high light pollution environment, again, that dual narrowband filter is going to allow you to cut through a lot of that light pollution and capture some really good detail on emission nebula. Now there are still some limitations, 
right? So one of the limitations is that the O3 is only going to work if you're shooting a target that's got a lot of O3 data. Not all targets have that O3 data out there. And a quick word for these tri-band and quad-band filters uh, that are out there. Uh, a lot of times a tri-band filter will pick up um, hydrogen alpha, O3, and uh, S2, sulfur, right? And a quad-band filter will take those three and add H beta, which is in the blue spectrum. So just keep in mind that if you use a tri or quad band filter, there's no way to separate the signal of each emission line. The S2 is red and HA is red. So if you're using a tri band filter that's collecting, uh, that's passing both those lines, they're both hit in your red pixels. There's no way to separate the hydrogen from the sulfur in the data. Now, it's still collecting a lot of information, a lot of data, and there are different things that you can do on the processing side to, you're still not going to be able to split it, but you know, you can kind of sort of fake a Hubble palette uh, with processing with these filters. Uh, but just be aware that the tri and quad band filters are not going to give a one shot color camera the same narrow band flexibility as a monochrome camera with those three narrow band filters. And those uh, tri and quad band filters, they tend to be pretty expensive. So it's like, you know, what's, uh, I mean, if you're buying one of those, then, then you're already eliminating one of the biggest advantages going one shot color camera, which is the reduced cost. And uh, that takes me to the next bullet point, which is there's a lot of filter options now available for one-shot color cameras. Now I got UV IR listed there as number one. Some one-shot color cameras don't require the UV IR filter, but others such as the ZWO ASI 533 MC does require a UV IR cut filter. Uh, some people may have a CLS filter. Uh, then you have these um, they're kind of like a mix between a narrow band and a broadband filter. It's like the L Pro. It's pretty wide, uh, but it it still cuts out a lot of a lot of light pollution, and it's 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 like a mix between a light pollution and a narrow band filter. And and they're interesting. And I've seen people use this filter and still use other kind of filters. And then of course you got your dual narrow band filters. Now, the HA and O3 filters have been around for a little while now. Uh, L Extreme is one example, which I happen to own a copy of that. Um, but now you've got a couple of companies out there that are finally coming out with S2 and O3 filters. And so the advantage here is that uh, you can do you can do legit Hubble palette SHO images now because you use your HA O3 filter on an emission target, and then you split the red channel from the green and blue channel. And there's your HA and O3. And then you do the same thing with the S2 and O3 channel and you split that red channel and you use that as your sulfur because it is real sulfur data. And now you can put together a SHO image. It's still not quite uh, as even as mono because again, only a quarter of your pixels are being used for the HA and only a quarter of your pixels are being used for the S2. You're getting lots of O3, which can be really good on some targets, but uh, your HA and S2 signal is still going to be weaker unless you, you know, compiled a ton of time on uh, integration time on these. And then you have, uh, I, ha I have filter wheel here. So I actually use a filter wheel with, uh, with my one shot color camera. But you got to think about it, especially if you're starting out and you're trying to decide which one to go with. And, and now you're looking at the prospects of going one shot color camera and picking up one, two, three, four filters and considering a filter wheel. You know, the, the, again, the cost advantage is, is quickly disappearing. And, uh, you know, maybe you should have gone mono in the first place. I think the biggest advantage of all these different filter choices now is that if you've already got the one shot color camera and you don't quite want to jump into the mono side, at least these filters give you options and they definitely work uh, well and it definitely narrows the gap in flexibility and performance between one shot color and mono.
Now, speaking of cost, <laughs> so with monochrome cameras, there's no way getting away from ha no way you're going to get away from uh, buying filters. You just have to, right? And just to do broadband, you got to get four filters LRGB. Uh, thankfully, LRGB sets tend to not be too expensive, but this is still an added cost on top of the camera. And of course, you're going to have to buy a filter wheel. I mean, I guess you can get away with doing a um, a filter draw and certainly certain systems like uh, like uh, Rasa's for example you're gonna have to use the filter draw I think uh, but the filter wheel just makes things way more convenient and way more consistent when doing flat frames and so it's just it's more cost and if you want to go full frame camera I mean holy cow those 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 uh, <laughs> filters are very expensive now I've got more weather dependent as a con on mono and what we mean here and I'm sure everyone is aware of this problem in fact <laughs> I suspect the anxiety of this happening is what drives a lot of people to choose one shot color over mono uh, let's say you start your imaging session and the clouds roll in right okay well I got my red data and green data I did not get my blue data oh no now what well you're not going to be able to put together a final image with the data that you that you've collected you have to wait for another another time to go back and get that uh, blue data. So if you're in a scenario where you only get a few hours a night to image, whether it's weather, I have it weather, whether it's weather or it's or some other uh, uh, reason that you just can't spend as much time imaging as you want to, um, then then this may be uh, a, a reason to stick with one shot color because this is definitely going to be a, a challenge for some people. Uh, and also, there's definitely more work to be done on the mono side. It's basically because you have each individual filter. You need to get flat frames for every every filter, especially if you're running a, a, a longer focal length scope. With my edge, you absolutely need to get flat frames. I mean, with the 70 millimeter scope, I mean, you can kind of get away without it. I mean, it's still definitely better with it um, but yeah you got to get those flat frames for every single filter and then there's processing steps that you have to do you got to crop each one you got to register them if your program doesn't automatically register them uh, I find that when using pics inside I got to run dynamic background extraction on each RGB uh, before combining uh, the help with the gradients that I have in this environment and of course you're doing separate processing on the luminance channel I'll run deconvolution on the luminance so there's definitely more steps to do with mono before you assemble all the channel colors and start working on the on the color image now as I may have mentioned before I have both uh, I have two monochrome cameras and I have a one-shot color camera and Actually, I lied. I have three monochrome cameras. So I started with monochrome. I went from DSLR straight to monochrome. And so just kind of to share my experience, uh, reiterating that mono is definitely, there's definitely more leg work with mono, uh, specifically with LRGB images. However, uh, when working with narrowband, uh, mono is actually easier than messing around with uh, dual dual narrowband uh, filters. There's no having to separate the colors or anything like that. Uh, with uh, monochrome and your SHO, it's very straightforward and it's it's. I find it easier to process that than than broadband data. Now I know in uh, PixInsight there's some new scripts out there that kind of auto uh, adjust the colors. Uh, to create a kind of uh, fake um, uh, SHO. So that's gotten easier. I haven't experimented with any of that stuff. And I believe other uh, pro uh, programs out there do the same thing. I believe APP also uh, can create a Hubble-esque uh, type uh, color palette with uh, dual band, narrow band, da uh, dual, dual band uh, data. Now also, uh, Doing LRGB versus one shot color, I have found that it's easier to get a good color calibration and good color balance with uh, with the mono data. It just seems to 
work easier. And perhaps that's related to the fact that uh, one shot color data has a heavy green bias. All right, so let's wrap this up. Which to choose? So my advice would be to go with one shot color camera if costs are a factor, if uh, you have a limited uh, window for imaging. Uh, it could be weather, it could be uh, obstructed views. Uh, when I started astrophotography, uh, my backyard was not an ideal place to do this and uh, I just had like a three, four hour window between my house and my neighbor's house and the trees and the street light. It, it, I just did not have a very good window. I could not image a single target all night long. Um, and also if you prefer a lighter workload. Now having worked with both of them, I will say that it is refreshing when I have my one shot color camera out there and I'm planning the sequence. It's like, okay, well, just don't have to worry about filters. I just got the one filter and put in the number of subs and just let it go. <laughs> so it is a little refreshing in that regard. It's refreshing not to have to take uh, uh, seven <laughs> sets of flats for different uh, uh, different filters. So it is definitely a, a lighter workload uh, on the acquisition side and uh, and the pre-processing side. So I mean, if you know yourself, if you this is a hobby, it's supposed to be fun. Uh, and the moment a hobby starts to become work, it's not a hobby anymore. So if if the idea of working with mono feels like it might be too much work, it might kill the fun in the whole process, then definitely stick with or go with one shot color. Now, for mono, if you want to do a lot of Hubble palette stuff, a lot of narrow band stuff, and you know I'm saying Hubble palette, I, I left out HOO, hydrogen, oxygen, oxygen. Uh, if you want to do a lot of emission nebula, mono really is the way to go because the the data that you get is so clean and compared to the one shot color camera that HA signal that is the most important signal when doing narrowband it's the most abundant signal that's out there and so only being able to utilize a quarter of your pixels it's it's really um, it's like tying one hand behind your back on on gathering data and the other thing is for folks that are in high light pollution environments you know, you may really want to consider narrow band, especially uh, as a mono, especially when thinking about narrow band targets, because uh, Bortle 8, I was in a Bortle 7 slash 8, I had street lights, really, the, the city put these brand new white LED street lights on the road behind me. They were very proud of these lights when they put them in, and uh, they were a killer. I mean, those lights were one of the main reasons I... I moved a couple years after getting into this hobby. So, but, but the HA filter cuts right through most of that. And, and the amount of data that you can get on these emission targets, it's just amazing. If, if you're starting out and whether one shot color camera or whatever, and you know how difficult it is with that light pollution, the first time you gather data with an HA filter, you're going to be blown away. All right, so the next bullet, not bothered by spending multiple nights on a single target. So, I mean, really, this is about where you do your astrophotography. If you have are able to do it in your backyard or someplace that's close by, especially if you can leave your rig out all night while you sleep, and you can leave it out for multiple days, uh, then, then monochrome is not a problem. It's not a big deal if you didn't get that blue data after clouds rolled in because you're going to be hitting that same target night after night anyway. Uh, and, and I got here in, in the brackets here, I wonder if this is where that misconception comes from, where you need more time with monochrome data, because you know, I can spend 50 hours on a target, no problem. I'm not, I'm not chasing many targets. Uh, so maybe people see that monochrome camera, this guy spent 50 hours on M33. I can't do that. I need to go one shot color camera. <laughs> uh, if, if you can't shoot in your backyard, uh, if you have to travel and set up, then yeah, one shot color makes a lot of sense because the, the hassle of being able to have to go out multiple nights to different locations just to complete the data set could be a problem. But if you don't have to do that, if you don't have those constraints, 
uh, then then mono's mono's a viable option. Uh, and then the third bullet I have here, if you already know mono's an ev eventuality. So for me, as I mentioned, I went mono first uh, after I wet my uh, cut my teeth with uh, with a DSLR. And I knew that I was in. I was totally locked in on this hobby, and I was going to be doing this for a long time. So it really just didn't make a lot of sense to go and do a do a half step to one shot color and then another step to get into mono. M mono was the eventuality because the flexibility with the narrow band was just too much for me to ignore. And it, as it turns out, emission targets are my favorite. They're my favorite targets in astrophotography. So I knew that it was going to be a little bit more complex with multiple filters. But I mean, honestly, it's not. It's not that much. I, I feel like for a lot of people, they, it's, it's uh, it, one of these issues that's uh, perhaps exaggerated. Now, I get it. Some people are not going to want to mess around with them. But at least for me, I knew I was going mono, and it just didn't make sense uh, to, to grab a one-shot color camera. Now, I did eventually buy a one-shot color camera. Uh, it was that 533 MC came out, and it was kind of like an impulsive move for me. I just, I just wanted to see what it, what Winchester Collar was about, and I also figured that uh, if I were to do a grab and go type setup where I was just going to go someplace dark skies for one night, you know, I thought the one shot color camera would be a a nice option for that. And of course, if money is no real object, uh, and you're wanting to jump into uh, the premium stuff right away, then yeah, might as well go uh, go mono. Um, if if you're in it for the long haul and and you're not phased by the cost of those filters, uh, then yeah, go for it. Alrighty, so kind of uh, final thoughts here. What about getting both? right? <laughs> That's always the best answer. Do I get this or that? Get both. Now, HARGB imaging uh, makes a very valid uh, case for potentially getting both. Now, HARGB imaging has been around for as long as astrophotography has been around. The most common uh, application of this is getting HA for your galaxy shots. Uh, but as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of HA out there. And so the shot you see on the right, that's the Perseus uh, double cluster. And um, there's a lot of HA in that region. And the way this image started out is the moon was out. Uh, I was like in between targets. I wasn't sure what to do. And I was looking at, at um, Instellarium. And I was kind of looking at where the, um, the Milky Way arms are at. And I got to thinking that I wonder, uh, given the location of that star cluster, I wonder if there's some uh, ISM out there, maybe some faint HA signals. So I just parked my telescope uh, in that area with the moon out and just gathered HA. And after you know, a few hours worth, I could definitely start to see some structure in there. And I ended up getting like 20 hours worth of HA, all with the moon out. And uh, it turned out to make a really uh, a cool image. I mean, you know, star clusters tend to be the least popular images out there. But now if you can throw some HA structure in the background, uh, now you've got a very interesting looking picture here. Uh, and, and on the left is another example, uh, a shot I took recently of the Cocoon Nebula. And there's a lot of faint HA in that area as well. Uh, one of my friends uh, not too long ago took a picture of Andromeda and he got a ton of hours uh, of HA and there's all this HA structure around around there. So you're starting to see more of these uh, uh, shots with uh, HA RGB shots. So the thing is this HA in, the, in these uh, this background HA is extremely faint and you need to get a lot of integration time. And if you try to do this with a one-shot color camera and say an L Extreme filter, and you split the red data off of the L Extreme data, I mean, again, you're only you're only using a quarter of your pixels, and so you know you're going to have to expose it, it. 
it becomes impractical, I think, to pick up some of this fainter stuff. So this is where a monochrome camera can step in. Uh, there's one astrophotographer out there. I don't remember his name. I think his name is Andy. His last name starts with an E. Uh, he has what I think is one of the best uh, cocoon nebula shots I've ever seen. And he used the uh, ASI 2400 MC on a, uh, on a Takahashi Epsilon for the broadband data. And then he used a QHY 600, I think, uh, with an HA filter. And oh, the image looks fantastic. So there is a lot of uh, options out there uh, with HA RGB. If you were to have both, let's say you have the, uh, you already have the one shot color camera and you're thinking about picking up mono, you can kind of ease the cost of the filters by getting the monochrome camera and just get the HA filter and then use the two cameras combined. Now I've seen some people talk about getting like dual setups and having one camera's loom and the other camera's RGB or, or one shot color. And I mean that works too for sure. Uh, but I'd almost rather have two monochrome cameras <laughs> and get RGB with the monochrome on one scope and loom with the other one. Or better yet, get loom with the other one and, and, and get uh, HA <laughs> at the same time. So, I mean, it's still, a, it's still an option there, but I think, I think the HA RGB is a more compelling choice. Uh, and incidentally, both of these images I took, they are HA RGB. I didn't use any luminance state on these. All right, so I think I'll uh, end it here. Uh, if you like this video, please consider giving it a thumbs up. And uh, if you're not already subscribed, uh, I'd really appreciate a subscription. Uh, if there's anything that I've left out uh, in this, uh, in this uh, debate of the ages <laughs> for astrophotographers, please put them in the comments. Um, I think in the end, uh, both options are viable. I'm not going to sit here and say one is better than the other for everyone. It depends on circumstances, depends on what you want to do, and what's going to be fun for you. All right, so with that, uh, clear skies and have a good evening.